Views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of Owen TV's management, staff, or board of directors. You got to get in the water to compete. Then there's a number of teams, they are in the shallows. If you can just get a hold of them and you start dragging their ass out to the deep, dark abyss, you can drown them. I just need you to trust me, that's all. Please. Because we'll tread water as long as it takes to fucking bury you. And it's been 30 years, 30 years! Throws, it is caught. I'm in Ross St. Brown, first down! That's gonna do it, that's gonna do it, that's gonna do it! All I think about is you guys. That's all I think about, man. That's all I you think about is you guys. And For the second time since 1957, for the first time since January 5th, 1992, these Detroit Lions are going to win a playoff game. Back loads, throws, picked up by the Lions, intercepted by the Lions, intercepted by the Lions. Derek Barnes, Derek Barnes, Derek Barnes. Hey, Detroit, you're going back to the NFC Championship yes, game. Sir. We're going to San Francisco. Yes, sir, let's go, baby, let's go. <laughs> Lomas is fired up. The Lions are going to San Francisco for the NFC title game. What year is it? 2024. Are we sure it's 2024? 2024. This is Views from the Sidelines. I'm Joey Tysick. That's Malik Hill. And uh, we're back after a week hiatus, unfortunately. Just schedules didn't line up. But uh, we missed... <laughs> we didn't get to talk about two Lions playoff wins, basically. Some uh, milestones in Detroit sports history. Yeah, it was insane. So we'll get to that. We'll, we'll save it for a little later. We want to get through some quick tidbits here first. But... Uh, Things are looking good in Detroit for the most part right now. Um, let's just start with the NBA because it's just what I had on the list first. A um, couple things in the NBA, interesting things, I guess you could say. Uh, the Pistons made a huge trade. Huge. Yeah. Blockbuster trade. Yeah. Maybe if this was like 10 years ago. Uh, the Pistons traded away Marvin Bagley. Okay, that's kind of nice. And we got Danilo Gallinari and Mike Muscala. We also gave them a couple picks for yeah. that trade. Wasn't it um, like future seconds? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's mostly a salary cap dump. Whatever. The Pistons are trash. We're still not going to talk about them. Um, then the most interesting trade is Pascal Siakam finally got traded. And uh, kind of, to me, it was kind of the sleeper team. He was rumored a lot of other places beforehand, um, but he ultimately lands with the Pacers. And the Pacers didn't give up Miles Turner, which I thought was interesting because they've been trying to trade him for forever. Um, so now the Pacers look like they're going all in uh, to try to win a championship, I guess, with Ty- uh, Tyrese Halliburton. How do you feel about this trade, Malik? Uh, I think it was a move that was necessary for the Pacers to take another step. Mm-hmm. It's clear that Tyrese Halliburton is at an all-star level right now. I'm not sure if he'll go to superstar level, but the stretch of games he's had in the past month have been incredible. He's had a few games over 20 points, mm-hmm. close to 20 assists and no turnovers. Just like f- close to flawless point guard play. And outside of him, they p- put a a good group of role players around him. Mm-hmm. And they played pretty good basketball. Made it to the championship of the play-in tournament, which almost seems like it didn't happen at this point. Right. But, Yeah. Pascal Siakam was one move to get them to the next step. They'll need to make another one Mm -hmm. because just Halliburton and Pascal Siakam won't get them to, they maybe could like surprise and make an Eastern conference finals run Mm -hmm. in the next year or two. But if they want to make the finals, they got to have like a stone cold star Yeah, next to not just Tyrese Halliburton, but also Pascal Siakam. Mm -hmm. Because Pascal has been an all-star, I think twice now, just twice. And Tyrese is, is probably going to make his first All Star team or this year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they they still have Buddy Heald apparently on the trading block. Yeah, um, I forgot the details of the trade because I forgot to pull it up. Um, the Raptors end up receiving Bruce Brown, who the Pacers signed in the off season. Uh, Kira Lewis from the Pelicans, Jordan Wara from the Pacers. They got uh, the Raptors also got two 2024 first round picks from the Pacers. And a conditional 2026 first round pick. Yeah, a lot of moving from the Raptors. Mm-hmm. Yep, a lot of moving. So 
interesting for the Raptors to make a couple trades recently, um, and now the Pacers getting in on the action. I assume there's probably going to be a couple more trades before the deadline, but uh, I, I think that was kind of the major one at this point, unless there's a surprise trade that comes up. But uh, yeah. Um, also, the Bucks made a head coaching change. Adrian Griffin got fired. And none other than the ESPN announcer, Doc Rivers. Not even half a season, and he's back in the league. Um, coaching for the Bucks now. And now the Bucks are also paying for three coaches. Their last two coaches that they fired are now still on the books, and now they're adding Doc Rivers to those contracts. Um, I don't know. This is a weird one. How do you feel about Doc Rivers coming back? I feel like Milwaukee should have known going for an experiment. There was a 50-50 chance this would happen with a brand-new young head coach. Not much experience in the NBA coaching these level of players. Mm -hmm. If the Bucks knew this could have happened, they could have just gone for Doc Rivers from the start. Yeah. Because you're 30 and 13. Damon and Giannis aren't the ex incredible duo everybody thought maybe from the jump. Right. I thought it would take some time, and it has. Mm -hmm. Both of them have had their uh, runs individually. They're still figuring it out together. Yep. It's clear that Giannis and Adrian Griffin have, haven't been on the same page throughout the season. Like you can you can visibly see it in Giannis's uh body language. Mm -hmm. Especially in the last few games, but there were times like in the play-in tournament too where it was clear they weren't on the same page. Right. But honestly, it just seems like a waste of time to me. <laughs> like like you said, they're paying three coaches now. Yeah. Why not just go for an experienced guy from the jump? mm Mhm. Especially and when you're, you're a championship caliber team. Exactly. Or that's what you're looking like you, for. You were taking a big chance and you just went with it because you have Giannis and Dame mm -hmm. and said, let's just see what happens. Yeah. And now this is like a kind of like a David Blatt situation where LeBron and David Blatt never like connected in terms of what to do on the court. Mm -hmm. And LeBron got him out of there. And it basically seems like kind of like that's what Giannis did. Right. They weren't going to mesh. So Giannis said, "We gotta, we gotta make a change." Now LeBron made it to the finals that year, mm -hmm. but the the East was weaker. Right when he made the finals, his first year back in Cleveland, mm -hmm. the top five in the East is pretty strong. Yeah, the Bucks could could lose in the first round. Oh yeah, if they play games, mm -hmm. and they're trying to make a change to, I guess just. I don't know if they think Doc Rivers can just instantly yeah. fix all these personalities and get everything together. Right. Like, it's been a while since 2008. I was going to say, that's my biggest thing is like, what does Doc Rivers bring to the table at this point? That, the one time he mixed a, uh, together a, like a group full of different personalities and three different superstars, Ray Allen, Paul Pierce, and K KG, mm -hmm. he made it instantly work for one year. Don't forget they about still Rondo. Were, and Rondo. They still were really good for the next three, four years, but they never got back to the finals. Well, they did the next year. Yeah. 2010. But, yeah, never won another championship. And since then, Doc Rivers has not been able to mm -hmm. work magic like he did that year. Right. He's a very good regular season coach. Mm -hmm. He's going to get the best of guys in the regular season. Yeah, look at all the Clipper teams that he had that did nothing. Yeah. He got the best out of Embiid and Ben Simmons in regular seasons. Mm hmm but when it gets to the playoffs and guys' egos start coming out yeah, and everybody's true colors start showing, Doc Rivers can't fix things. Mm -hmm. It's shown the past two stops. Now you're just throwing it. You're throwing him in almost halfway through mm -hmm. a season. Like, are you? do you expect Doc to be here for like two, three years? And Dame is going to be here for the next two or three years. And they're all just going to take their time. How much more? How much longer do you think Giannis has? Right of his prime, mm -hmm. like he's in his prime right now. Yeah, and he's hitting. He's won two MVPs already. He's getting triple doubles nowadays. Like he's just expanding his game every like, year. Dame is over thirty. Mm -hmm. Chris Middleton is on the downslide right now. Yep. How much time do you actually think you have? Yeah. Just throwing Doc in, also knowing he's not a magic worker. Right. He doesn't just. It's it's not 
what it used to be. It's not the same. Yeah. So I, I, I just, I don't know what they're expecting out of this move. Yep. And I, I personally don't like it for Doc either because I like what he's done on ESPN mm-hmm. and the inside information he's been given, like in podcast interviews on different platforms. Yeah. I've liked that side of Doc more than the coach. And he's just jumping right back into coaching for some reason. I, I don't understand it. Right. On either side. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know if I like it either. It seems weird. Um, but you know, wh- whatever they want to do, it's it's fine. Um, is there any I don't oh. know if it's fine. <laughs> I don't know if it is. Um Yeah, I don't <laughs> all I was gonna say is I guess it, it matters. I don't know if Chris is loyal to the Bucks anymore since they fired. Mike Budenholzer is gone. I I don't so, think he's yeah. Um I'll have to ask him about it. But um the only other thing in the NBA that I can think of worthy of talking about happened last night. Was it last night or Monday night? I've lost the days of the week because it was Monday night. Was it Monday night? Yeah. Cause uh, we had a remote work day yesterday. So like it feels uh, my days are all off this week. Um, Monday night, Joel Embiid went crazy, set a Sixers franchise record uh, for most points in a game. He scored 70. And then, Carl Anthony Towns had 63 for the Timberwolves, which 62. Broke, yeah. 62, which broke his previous franchise record of 60, 60 I think. Yeah. Um, what do you make of these two games? Embiid, obviously, just he's going for MVP. The Carl Anthony it's, Towns, we'll talk about that one. It's, it's really weird how different the games are. Mm-hmm. Joel, he, he just came out. In, <laughs> Whoops. He came out and was in attack mode from the jump. It was clear that Victor doesn't have the body to deal with someone like Joel Embiid, who has an old school big man body, but like modern skill. Yeah. So Victor wasn't doing anything with him. Mm-hmm. No matter who you switched, they weren't doing anything with him. Right. He would get to his position. It, w- it was pretty much over. If he pump fakes, he's taking you to the rim. Mm-hmm. He's either scoring or getting fouled. He's a high level free throw shooter at this point. Yeah. Shooting in the 80s. And, like, most of the second half, he was just, like, slow dribbling into mid-range jumpers. Mm-hmm. And he was in such a groove that it everything was just water yeah. for the most part. Mm-hmm. Now, after the end of the third, I thought he was going for Kobe's record. Yeah, He had 59 at the end of the third. Mm-hmm. I figured they would let him play, like, nine or ten minutes to try and go for it. Yeah. But they sat him for, like, four and a half, almost five minutes. Right. He and came he- in. Keep going, I'm- uh, he came in, uh, he hit two jumpers, he hit some free throws. They started double-teaming him. He missed a few shots. Mm-hmm. And then once he hit 70, the they, the crowd just stood up and applauded, and they, yeah. they took him out the game. And he didn't even break, like, the recent – I just called it the recent record of Donovan Mitchell's 71. He had – he hit his 70th point with two minutes to go, I think, in yeah. the game. So, like, for them to not get him one more bucket just seemed – it was if odd. the game was closer, I feel yeah. like they would have kept it going. But they, yeah, they were up by like fifteen mm-hmm. on the Spurs, so they didn't feel like pushing it. But right, I wish they would have let them go for it. Yeah, and man, I know the game is more catered towards offensive players these days, but it's still impressive when somebody puts up seventy points. It just doesn't seem real. Um, seventy and eighteen. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Will Chamberlain stats. And then on the other side with Cat, he had forty. What did you say? Forty. 44 in the first Four, half. Yeah. 44 in the first half. Which his, was, his first half was almost even crazier. It he was. was. 8 of 8 from 3. Yeah. And so we thought he was going to set the scoring record. We thought he was going to score, get the three-point record, honestly, was in play at that yeah. point. Um, but there was a problem. <laughs> there was a big problem. The Timberwolves thought the same thing as you. Yeah. And they played like they just wanted the record. Mm-hmm. Anthony Edwards. And guess what happens when you play like that? You lose the game. <laughs> and what did they do? They lost the game. And not only did they lose the game, as they're still the number one seed, right, for the West, they lost to the Hornets yeah. of all teams. The Hornets. Now, I know LaMelo Ball's back, so they're they're playing better. But you're losing to one of the worst Eastern Conference teams a- on top of it. Um, so it was pretty crazy. Anthony Edwards, I think, even said that they were trying to feed Cat. Yeah. Um, he and- admitted it. Was, it shows his maturity, mm-hmm. but also shows how much more he has to learn. Yeah. Because... Chris Finch was he was pissed. Yeah, <laughs> he was angry. He called it disgusting basketball. Mm-hmm. He said they were extremely immature, which 
it was disgusting and they have more to learn. Right. Because you can't just give up playing actual NBA basketball yeah. and just try to feed somebody to break a record. Especially when he slowed way down in the second half. He started missing a lot more shots. He wasn't as efficient. Um, whereas, like, Joel Embiid, you know, he still played his game, but yeah. they catered to him a little bit more. So you still have to play within the game. It's it's tough, but it was kind of funny to watch, to be honest. They, because It's unfortunate to say this kind of makes me a hater, but I don't care. It was funny seeing it happen to Cat in Minnesota. Yeah. Even with them having this great season, Carl Anthony Towns is like one of the three most frustrating players of this generation to me. Mm -hmm. Ben Simmons being number one. We don't even have to go into that. Yeah. But Carl Anthony Towns is one of the most talented big men of like the past 20 years. Yeah. I would say Anthony Davis is up there too in certain aspects. The Kentucky boys. Anthony Davis has more dog in him than Carl Anthony Towns. Yeah. Like, Carl is so talented that he has these types of games Mm -hmm. where he just won't miss. Right. And then you look up, and it's like, oh, he scored 20 more points, and it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. And it's it's the usual cat. Yeah. It's frustrating. Yeah. A little unfortunate, but... uh, Yeah, 62, though. Congratulations, I guess. Franchise record for Timberwolves. Sure. Um, Anything else you want to touch on on the NBA before we move on to college basketball? Um... I want to bring up one thing for t- in particular. Okay. I feel like the standings think, are mostly the same. Yeah, the standings are the same for the most part, but well, OKC is tied for the first seed, and it's oh, they are now tied. Yeah, it's a good thing they're in the first seed now because I'm bringing up a player from OKC. Hmm. I think nobody knows what Jalen Williams, not Jalen with a Y, the big man from Arkansas. Yeah. Jalen Williams from Santa Clara. Mm-hmm. I don't think people understand what he's doing this season and how Sam Presti has hit on this type of player again makes no sense. Yeah. He's averaging 19, four and four assists, four and a half assists. Mm-hmm. He's shooting almost 55% from the field and he's yeah. shooting 45% from three mm-hmm. and 82 from the, from the line. Yeah, he's pretty I good. don't understand how a, who knew him going into the draft last year. Yeah. He is making NBA basketball look easy. Mm-hmm. Like, and people, I think a lot of people still don't even know who he is. Yeah. No, I'm sure they don't. And he's like barely missing shots. Mm-hmm. There was like a stretch of games two weeks ago. It was a stretch of seven games where he was hitting, it was like 10 to 15, 12 of 16, 13 to 17. I don't understand how he is doing this, how he is making the game look so easy, yeah, and how Sam Presti keeps pulling off this wizardry. Mm-hmm. I don't think he does this anywhere else. He goes in the NBA. Yeah. But you get Jalen Williams from Santa Clara, an experienced college guy. He just steps in, plays well as a rookie second year. Mm-hmm. He's barely missing shots, and he's almost averaging 20. Yeah. But And I, I don't think anybody knows what, what he's doing. The funny thing, I just looked it up real quick. Because I thought it, this was true, you know where they got that pick from? From us? No. Oh, from who? It was from the Paul George trade. So they got SGA wow. and Jalen Williams. Technically, they got that draft pick in the same I, deal. I hate Sam Presti. <laughs> I, I I hate it. So one man shouldn't have all this power. In the words of Kanye West, this this shouldn't happen. Yeah. Chet is also developing extremely yes. well. They might have a little curse with Josh Giddy, but that I. His, his play topic. is falling off. Yeah. Josh Giddy has been a bad basketball player this year. Mm-hmm. So that might be the one that didn't hit. Right. But everything else, it, it's ridiculous. His hit rate. And yeah. Jalen Williams is I, – I, you can't explain what he's doing. Mm-hmm. It's great to see, and he's becoming one of my favorite younger players. But it's it's it's, it's crazy, and it's amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So shouts out to Jalen Williams for playing like a like almost flawless second-year player. Right. And developing like crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it'll be interesting. Also, Casey Wallace is shooting like 46% from three. And they picked him in the 20s. Yeah. So congratulations. Mm-hmm. And once again, the West is crazy. Golden State right now out of the playoffs. OKC and Minnesota are the one and two right now. The Lakers. Who would have predicted that? Lakers are the nine seed. Dallas is the eight seed. Sacramento, who was the two seed last year, is now the seven seed. Phoenix having their struggles. Like, I mean, Denver is Denver, but. Yeah, to see some of those other young teams like the Pelicans. Any thoughts on your Pelicans? They're 
they're still so up and down. Like they yeah. they don't give you anything for long periods of time. Short sense of excitement. Yeah. So like there'll be a game where like Brandon Ingram goes crazy, and then there's a game where Zion does really well, but. Still waiting for them to like fully put it together, I think. Looks like Jordan Hawkins was a really good pick. I wanted the Pistons to get him. I wanted the Pistons to trade out and get him. But uh, to no avail. Best shooter in the draft. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's move on to college basketball real quick. Not a ton to talk about, but uh, a few little things we wanted to, to mention. The, the, uh, the Michigan teams. Um, Michigan just got blown out by <laughs> Purdue last night. Yeah, just destroyed them. Wasn't even close. Uh, Not at all. Is it? It's official. Michigan is the worst team in the Big Ten. I thought it was Penn State. Uh, they well, might be second worst. Let's see. I, I, I'm pretty sure Penn State is at the bottom. Okay, oh, Michigan. Michigan, two and six. <laughs> ah, yeah. Oh, go blue. That's they, that's amazing. I think they also have the worst overall record too. Yeah, they do. They're they're bad. Seven and twelve. They're they're just bad. Yeah. Yeah. How do you, how does that make you feel, Malik? Uh, they're garbage, and nobody should talk about them. Okay. And Jawan Howard should be fired. Mm -hmm. And until they get a new coach, I don't care. Because it's just a waste of talent. I saw Jalen Llewellyn played. He actually played all right. Good for him. Which is weird. Yeah, good for him. Um, The Doug McDaniels situation is really weird. Uh, Suspension Uh, on road games. Six road games. (laughs) I I don't get it. Listen, Joey. (laughs) Listen. They're losers. How do they recover? You get rid of the coach. Just get rid of the coach. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you have to. You have to rebuild the mentality of this program. Mm-hmm. Everything John Beeline instilled is gone. Yeah. Like Juwan succeeded for his first few years off of players that were ready to go mm-hmm. and knew how to win. Ever since he's brought in his own players, what's happened? Is this the same situation as the the Pistons and the Lions? He what sacrificed exactly? Michigan basketball for Michigan football. I mean, basically, <laughs> when was the last time they were both like. like the early '90s? Was the last time they were both really good? It was like the was very, it? the very beginning. And the Lions were good. Too. The very beginning of the Harbaugh era, but that's when Harbaugh couldn't get over the big game. Um, they were both decent at that time. Yeah, but yeah, Michigan football wins the national championship. Basketball sucks again. Mm-hmm. And in the state of Michigan, basketball and football can't both be good. Apparently, it's incredible. Uh, Michigan State basketball also not they're so okay yeah they're, they're okay that's <laughs> yeah. a good that's a good they're literally they're like smack dab in the middle of the big 10 mm-hmm. they beat to penn state handily which they were supposed to do they kind of got whopped by northwestern had a close loss to illinois that seems to be another thing uh, they they're, on, they're on a three-game win streak yeah that's good and they beat rutgers against average and, and kind of bad they're teams, beating but, who they're supposed to beat. yeah at least this um, game against Wisconsin Friday, they might get smacked. Yeah, and then <laughs> that would be a. Then they play Michigan at the end of the month. I'm not watching that game. It's on Peacock, unless like I come over to your place and we just like pull up Peacock 9 p.m. and just like drink some beers and and just laugh is and that, watch this game. Is that like stream? Yeah, it's stream it's exclusively. It's a Tuesday night. Is it? Yeah. It's a Tuesday. To, I'm not watching that. Tuesday mess. at nine on Peacock Listen, exclusively. I'll, I might watch the highlights the next day. Hmm. I'm not giving Peacock the satisfaction. Yeah, I'm not going to watch that game. <laughs> but yeah, it, the Big Ten, it's it's the real deal. Wisconsin actually sitting at the top uh, right now because Purdue just lost again, not too long ago. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. Listen, shouts out to Northwestern and Nebraska. Mm-hmm. Who are both better than Indiana and Michigan State right now, and Ohio State? Mm-hmm. Uh, Nebraska has become my team this year. Kase Tomonaga, yeah, is the college Steph Curry. Mm-hmm. He's just a lefty, but he wears thirty. Yep, I love the way he plays. I love the up and down game they play, and they shoot a lot of threes. Mm-hmm. And Northwestern has become a good basketball program. Yeah, and that's that's really cool to see. Mm-hmm. They they just. They play good, like, consistent basketball. Yeah. They don't have any, like, standout superstars. They just play good team ball. It's funny, like, they play similar, like, with their football team. Like, their football team had a good season, and there's nothing, like, special about them. <laughs> so, it's funny how Northwestern is kind of like, like it's that. It's kind of special every time they have good seasons in basketball, which is yeah. which is the, yeah, the part. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, good for them. Right. Um, I'll quickly go over the top 25 because I haven't mm-hmm. done it in a little bit. But, uh. 
UConn at the top after winning a national championship. They're, they're so good. It's crazy. And uh, they lost a lot, and they just basically refilled. Um, Purdue's still number two. Uh, and then we have UNC up to three. climbing back up there. Yeah, they, they just smacked Wake Forest, who's having a good season. Yeah. They're, they're playing really good. They're a weird team because last year they missed the, the tournament. It was all hype. The year they were before, expected to be the number one coming back. Right. The year before, they were another hype team with Caleb Love, Baycott, all those guys. Then they just bounced last year, and then now they got rid of Caleb Love, and now they're back up yeah. top. It's, like the the players they got rid of and the guys they brought in, they're mm-hmm. like a balanced, more the, the team makes sense. Yeah. And they're playing really well. And then we got Houston, Tennessee, Kentucky, uh, Kansas has fallen off a little bit. They've lost a couple games. Um, the big loss was to UCF. That was a pretty wild game. Fun to watch. And then they also lost to West Virginia. I forgot about that one um, just a couple days ago. Uh, then we got Auburn, Arizona, Illinois, Oklahoma, Duke, Wisconsin, Marquette, Baylor, Dayton, Creighton, Utah State, Memphis, Texas Tech, BYU, FAU, Iowa State, Colorado State, and New Mexico finally making it in. New Mexico is fun to watch. Have you watched them at all? Yeah. Jalen House. Yeah. Eddie House's son. Yeah. Jamal Mashburn Jr. Mm-hmm. It's fun basketball. Right. Uh, they're a good team to watch. Uh, they could be a dangerous tournament team, to be honest. Um, but I don't know. I, this is why I love college basketball. I keep saying it every, every, every single year. College basketball gets more entertaining because, like, if you look at all these teams towards the bottom, the Dayton's – Creighton's been a while around for a while now, uh, but Utah State, BYU, FAU, Colorado State, New Mexico, like seeing them, those kind of teams in the top 25 is always fun for me. Um, so I can't wait till, you know, this Lions run is over and I can start diving back into college basketball a little bit more. I've been I've been slowly ramping up, but, you know, once football yeah, season's we're over. We're almost past the halfway point of the college basketball season, which is yeah. insane. Mm-hmm. We're not far away from March. I know. So that's where we'll we'll dive in basically all next month and and talk about that kind of stuff. But it's been fun. So yeah. should I bring up a few teams or players that I go for it? Yeah. So I, I'm actually I'm going to bring up some players from these teams that I think people need to pay attention to. If you haven't heard his name yet or paid attention to him, Dalton Connect at Tennessee. He okay. scored over thirty like three times in the past two weeks. Mm-hmm. He's a transfer from Northern Colorado. Yeah. That came to the SEC. He's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Like he just has game on on top of game. He can shoot from from deep. He shoots at a high clip from three. He has athleticism. He can dunk on you. He he's just he's a problem. Yeah. And he's like single handedly taken out some teams in the past few weeks. Dalton Connect is the truth. Uh, Kansas true freshman that's coming on named Johnny Furphy. Yeah. Kid from Australia. Mm-hmm. He scored in double digits like the past four games. He's six nine. He can shoot it. I don't know what type of player he's going to turn into, but he shows signs of a guy that could be like an all-American level guy. Yeah, he's he's exciting. Aiden Holloway from Auburn, mm-hmm. high, high, high level shooter. If he comes out this year, I think he'll be like picked in the twenties, maybe, hmm. because he's he's kind of small, right. not that great of a defender. Mm-hmm. But when he gets going on offense, he's it's like almost impossible to stop. Yeah, he lets it fly, and he's he's just a high level shooter. Mm-hmm. Um. Who next? Dayton at 16. Dayron Holmes. Heard the name. He was a high-level four-star guy coming out of high school. Mm-hmm. Chose to go to Dayton. Never wavered from his commitment. Stayed there. He's in his third year at Dayton. And right now, he is averaging 28 rebounds on 43% from three. Mm. He is a 6'10 forward. 6'10", 235. Yeah. And, yeah, putting up those numbers, he's dominating right now. hmm And Dayton only has two losses. Right. Yeah, they're they're running through their conference right now. They could make another run. hmm They're exciting to watch. And I think people aren't paying that much attention to FAU because they've kind of slid down yeah. a few spots. They've had a few losses. Right. But they're pretty much like the same roster from last year, and those guys are still hooping. Mm-hmm. Like, John L. Davis is averaging 18 on 50% shooting. I think he's the one guy that's going to be like the pro off the team. Yeah. He's playing really well. And one more player I'm going to bring up from Iowa State, who's having a really good season right now. True freshman, 
Mylon Momchilovich. Mylon Momchilovich. Remember okay. the name. Okay. I'll try. True freshman from Milwaukee. Six eight like combo three four guy, he's averaging thirteen points and three rebounds, almost fifty percent shooting, thirty nine percent from three. He reminds me of like a Danilo Gallinari type player. Hmm. He has length. He's from Milwaukee, but he's he has a European name. He has a European type game. Mm-hmm. Like he's a guy you give in the post. He's gonna face up like one dribble pull. Yeah, turn around jumper, hit threes in people's faces. He's a skilled shooter mm-hmm. and a skilled offensive player. And he's one of the biggest reasons why Iowa State's having a really good season. And if he comes out, I would keep an eye on him. Mm-hmm. Mylon Momchilovich from Iowa State. Okay. Really good player. Nice. And shouts out to Oakland, even though I have a beef with uh, their head coach. I'm not even going to say his name. I have a beef with their head coach. Oakland is still playing good basketball. Mm-hmm. Shouts out to DQ Cole from Pontiac. Starting right now at the three, playing good basketball. Trey Townsend from Oxford. Trey Townsend, too. That's a cool one. They're at the top of the horizon right now, seven and two. Yeah. Keep it going. Make the tournament. Right. Finally. Please. It's been a long time. Like, ah. Been a long time. That's all I'll say about Oakland. Okay. All right, let's get into the best part. The Lions. They're going to the NFC Championship game. They beat the Rams. They beat Matthew Stafford. They beat Baker Mayfield and the Bucks, and now they have to go on to the road at San Francisco. Let's quickly recap the games. Uh, the first wild card playoff game, Lions beat the Rams 24-23. Didn't allow Stafford to make some miracle play to win the game. Puka Nakua was a monster. Just destroyed us in every way possible. But Jared Goff, I think, was flawless. He was 20, what was it, 22? Of 27 for 277 and one touchdown, no mistakes. Montgomery got in the end zone. Amon Ra had a huge game. Uh, Sam Laporta played injured, but he got a touchdown in a key spot. And I think the the biggest part of that game, underrated, Michael Badgley hitting the 54-yard field goal. Yeah. I think that was the kind of the biggest surprise. One of the few 50-yard field goals he's hit in his career. Yeah, and probably the biggest at this point, I would say. Uh, The Lions did their job on defense for the most part. They stopped Kyron Williams decently. Um, Like I said, Puganakua got his, but that was about it. Uh, They held Cooper Cup in check for the most part, and uh, they survived. And, yeah, it was just a great game, great atmosphere. Um, My brother said it was the loudest, coolest thing he's ever seen. Um, The Jared Goff chants and just all the backstory to that game was incredible. Uh, do you any, have any other takeaways from that game? It was tight in the end. Uh, beforehand, I I told my friends, I think I told you too, I was more afraid of Puka Nakua than Cooper Cup in that game mm-hmm. because Puka Nakua was the guy that could stretch the field and take the top off. Right. Cooper Cup only had five catches for like 27 yards. Every receiver they play <laughs> that has big playability has gone off, mm-hmm. and that's because they don't have a number one corner. It is what it is. Yeah. But – yeah, they they did what they had to do mm-hmm. to win the game. Yeah. And that's, that's what they've been doing all season. They've just figured out ways to win. Mm-hmm. And it came up the same way in in this past game against the Bucks. Mm-hmm. Jared Goff has had his two best playoff games of his career. Yeah. If you look through the history of it, like his playoff games, I think he played six playoff games with the Rams. Mm-hmm. He was just like decent or average in most of those games. Yeah. He has been a high-level quarterback. Mm-hmm. In these two playoff games, yep, and they've needed it. Yeah, that is it's huge from Jared Goff. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, the crazy thing in the Rams game too was it uh, was something that I pointed out to a lot of people was that Dan Campbell, we obviously know he's really aggressive on fourth down. Sean McVay has been known to punt the ball away a lot, and that's what happened in that game. Sean McVay punted the ball away. I mean, sure, you can. I I think he was relying on his defense. That their defense was playing good at that point. But you gave the Lions the ball with four minutes left, and they just meticulously drove the ball down the field, got first downs, and then Jared Goff threw a strike to Amon Ra St. Brown for the first down, ended the game. And it's like when the Lions get the ball, they can just control the clock. And the thing almost happened in the Bucks game, um, but they kind of blew it, so to speak. But um, their defense was able to step up big. Derek Barnes had a huge interception. 
uh, that ended the game. Didn't the allow first reception of his career. First yeah. interception. Of his and career. apparently that that was like the first time that his kid went to the game or something. He said, I think. Mm. Um, so a lot of cool things coming together. Um, Ifatu Melifanwu with another interception in this game too early on to give the Lions momentum. Um, they just the, again the Lions just seem to be making plays at the right times in these games. Baker Mayfield played pretty good. Mike Evans is generational. I think people forget about Mike Evans a lot, even though he's he's had a, a thousand yards. Never every been season. never been under a thousand in his, in his career. Yeah, which is wild. Um, he's six five and can move. So like it's just it's so hard to guard. So I don't even fully blame Cam Sutton in that game. Although he did get torched and he gets turned around way too much. That's yeah. my biggest problem with Sutton uh, recently. But again, the Lions just they make plays when they have to. And that's the important part. And people keep dogging their defense, dogging their defense. They're winning games. And at the end of the day, that's all you have to do in the in the NFL is win the game. Um, so it's pretty exciting. Um trying to think of anything else from this Bucks game. Oh, Jameer Gibbs is the real deal. A hundred plus yards receiving and uh rushing combined. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he had a huge thirty two yard touchdown or whatever. Yeah. That listen would with- that cutback to get through the hole was impressive alone. Mm-hmm. But when he faces up with Antoine Winfield yeah. and just turns on a dime and just hits the, oh, my God. Yeah, it was crazy. The waste of a pick, Jameer Gibbs. <laughs> yeah. Who would have thought? And I, even I questioned it a little bit. I didn't hate the pick. Yeah, we both knew his talent level. Right. That's why I wasn't mad at the pick. Mm-hmm. But you're just concerned of how it's going to fit. And now we're it, seeing it. It fit instantly. Yeah. Um, Sam Laporta looked a lot healthier this game. Nine catches. He had like eleven targets, um, and even Amon Ross St. Brown, he like he t- he technically had a bad game, um, which is weird. Listen, he he had the biggest catch of the season yeah. for the Lions. Mm-hmm. Was it third and fifteen? Yeah, I think so. Third and fifteen. Yeah, he ran like a a long curl route. Yeah, and he and even carried two dudes. He even said it on his podcast today. I listened to it um, on the St. Brown uh, St. Brown Brothers podcast. He said he. He knew that he messed up his route because he was supposed to get to the first down line. Yeah, he broke curled. it off at like 13 or 14 Yeah, he's yards. like, he realized that he curled too early. And when he saw that, he's like, I had to hold on the ball. And then I dragged. And he was like, if I didn't have the ball secure, Levante David was going to pop it out. And then he just somehow fought for it. And he knew when he landed that he had the first down. He's Listen, like, him, him having that running back size mm-hmm. and strength, seeing him drag those dudes while turning around and holding, that was so impressive. Yeah. Plus the the chemistry between him and Goff, like Goff just throws a dart to him, and he just he's his hands are so strong, he catches so many of these balls. Yeah, and he he was it the Bucks game where he had that drop. Yeah, he had one of the most uncharacteristic drops yeah. of his career. Mm-hmm. Wide open, probably would have went like twenty plus yards after the catch. Yeah, he actually had like a couple little drops in that game. That's why I said he he technically had a bad game. Yeah, yeah, fourteen targets. Yeah, uh, nine catches. I think he had like seventy seven yards or something yeah. like that. So nothing crazy, but he had a huge touchdown too. That was a beautiful play. Yeah. Also, shouts out to I think at this point, maybe like the the most underrated number two in the league, Josh Reynolds. Oh yeah. I mean, every time fan favorite Josh Reynolds. Every time they need something, he I haven't seen him drop an important catch. Yeah. Since he's been in Detroit, and they scheme him up in the red zone so well, wide open. Yeah. He's always open. Mm-hmm. And even Jamison Williams always. He's been making important catches. Speaking too. of scheming up, the the wildest thing. So Craig Reynolds got a touchdown in this game. On the St. Brown Brothers podcast, Amon Ross said that was the wrong personnel. Hmm. Craig Reynolds was never supposed to be in that. But when I was confused of why he was in but, the game. But but when I watched it live, I thought this is perfect. Like Craig Reynolds is in the game. They probably think they're going to pass it. It did end up yeah, working out And perfectly. he runs it in, and he just yeah. crashes through the line. Um, so that was really cool to see. Um, but it just seems like the Lions just – they have things going for them right now. And I hate, like, comparing, but it's that similar vibe to the 2004 Pistons. And I don't want to, like, think that we're going to make the Super Bowl automatically, but, like, it just has that feeling where everybody just feels like they don't think the Lions can do it. Like, the Lions have all these faults here, all these faults here. And people aren't looking at, like, the other side, like, the positives for the Lions for the most part. And so it's, like, frustrating where, like I said, they're winning games. Yes, maybe it's not the prettiest win, but they're winning games in the end of the day. 
Yeah, uh, I I would compare it more going football. They they don't have the exact pieces of this team, but they remind me of like the 07 Giants. Okay. Who came in, won four games. I think they won four, they won like three road games to get to the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. Beat Brett Favre. I can't remember the other two teams they beat, but ended up playing Tom Brady and the Patriots in the Super Bowl mm-hmm. and upsetting them. Like things just went the Giants' way. Yeah. In the playoffs that year. Mm-hmm. And kind of in 2011 too when they won the Super Bowl. Right. But it, it it they remind me of those types of teams where they've gotten to the playoffs and things are just happening mm-hmm. that are going their way at the right times. Right. And they all their most important players are all on top of their game right now. Yeah. And again, the defense, the cornerbacks have been rough. The safeties, however, Listen, have Brian, been elite. Brian Branch. These rookies. Melifon Wu. How did they rookie, do it? But yeah. The rookie class is incredible. Is This is, like, honestly one of the best rookie classes. How do you not rank this yeah. as, like, one of the top ten rookie classes in NFL history? <laughs> and my favorite thing is all the people that are showing, like, all the analysts and stuff last year that gave the, gave the Lions, like, Ds and Fs in the draft. Oh, my God. Because they reached on everybody. Listen, their, their second first-round pick hasn't even gotten to where he can be yet. Yeah. And their other first three picks mm-hmm. are all essential pieces to a playoff run. Yeah. A championship run. The only – like knock you can have on their draft is Jack Campbell, but we that's still, what I'm saying. Jack, but we still think he has he st- exactly a good chance to be something. So, yeah, I, it, it's insane, man. It's crazy. It's it's it, it just shows how good this regime has drafted. Like people said, they started with Penesul, and then they got Amonra, and then it just seems like all these pieces just just come together. Um, and it's it's pretty crazy. It's it's wild. Yeah. Um, you know, one piece I feel like. Deserves some credit, but stat wise, you wouldn't. It wouldn't make any sense. I think the Donovan Peoples Jones signing has been really important. With okay. Khalif Raymond going down, yeah, I think there are other guys you could put in that returner position, and they would be messing up and True. be nervous. Yeah, there would be some drop punts, some punts caught like it, it within the five. Okay, I get what you're saying. I think in terms of being a smart returner. And not making any mistakes and just setting the team up to keep going. Donovan Peoples Jones hasn't made any mistakes yeah. as a punt returner. Mm-hmm. And when they put him in the game to block and and make catches when he needs to, he's done it. Yeah, that's fair. But yeah, I, I really think as a punt returner, he hasn't broken off anything big. Mm-hmm. But do you know other guys, you put them in that position in those pressure moments, they will mess up. Yeah. Donovan has done everything right yeah. in that position. It does make me miss Khalif, though. He had some. Yeah, Khalif. He had some really good returns towards oh, yeah, the end of the season. Definitely. So, but yeah, you, you're right. That that's a good point. That yeah, he's it doesn't a show up in guy. the stats, but yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So now, like I said, we're going to San Francisco. We're playing the number one team in the NFC. What is your confidence level of this game? The 49ers showed some cracks in their armor that last game. Mm-hmm. Now, a big part of it was not having Debo Samuel, but. If all it takes is losing one of your superpowers, mm-hmm. you got Christian McCaffrey, you got George Kittle, you got a really good run game, more than more than just Christian McCaffrey. Yeah, Brandon Ayuk is a really good receiver. He, he's become one. Mm-hmm. Jawan Jennings is a quality possession receiver. Mm-hmm. I assumed without Debo Samuel, they were just going to run like everything was normal. Right. You're playing against the Packers, who have a lame duck defensive coordinator at this point. Yeah. A young quarterback who hasn't played in this type of playoff game before, mm-hmm. and a bunch of young players. It's it was new for everybody for the Packers, right? And they were absolutely comfortable in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. They didn't look afraid. They were getting. I mean, Aaron Jones was cracking off like seven yards a run. Yeah, in Aaron the first Jones half. looked like he turned the clocks back. Everybody looked extremely comfortable in San Francisco in that game. Like, the rain was affecting Brock Purdy. Mm -hmm. It wasn't affecting Jordan Love. No. Jordan Love was making the same types of passes. Mm -hmm. Their offense was flowing, and the defense was making things hard. Yeah. And that's without, like, Christian Watson even being healthy. Like, he was out there, but he wasn't doing anything. If the Green Bay Packers can do that in San Francisco, Mm -hmm. what do you think the Detroit Lions can do? Yeah. Now, the odds of the 49ers doing that back-to-back games, who knows? Yeah. They had a three-game losing streak in the season. Mm Mm-hmm. So they've shown they can go up to the highest of the yeah. highs, and they can go low. Yeah. And they got some nagging injuries. Mm-hmm. Brock Purdy has showed his flaws. Yep. 
I don't know, man. And one of their weaknesses, recently at least, has been their run defense. Yeah. What do the Lions do really well? Chase Young has done nothing. Yeah. The the (laughs) Lions run the ball really well. If if Ragnow can just inject him with whatever they gave Patrick (laughs) Mahomes last year. That's what I always say. Give him the secret stuff. (laughs) (laughs) That's the stuff. Or whatever they gave Trevor Lawrence to play, give Frank Ragnow that stuff. Um, Jonah Jackson is out. That's going to hurt a little bit. But I think, what's his name? Awasika that came in uh, for relief. I think he did pretty good. So, I mean, and our tackles are still intact. That's a, the big thing for us. So, if Ragnow can play, the center of the tackles are good. Yeah, whenever they down. go in shotgun, they're going to have to have their running back on the left. Mm-hmm. Just for some extra protection. Yeah. And, uh, and doesn't Chase Young comes off of Pinay Sewell's side, doesn't he? I believe I'm pretty sure so. that, yeah. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I you, so. you, get, you need extra help over there with Nick Bosa, especially mm-hmm. with, yeah. So, it'll be crazy. Um, but the way that Jameer Gibbs is playing right now, like, he could gash them at times. Um, David Montgomery can be the thumper, the blocker. Yeah. Um, I think this will be a, a fun game between Iowa tight ends of George Kittle and Sam Laporta because I think they're very similar where they can just find the extra space, but they also fight for extra yards every play, it seems like. Yeah. I also think an uh, underrated storyline, the 49ers defensive backs. Yeah. They looked bad against the Packers. Mm-hmm. Ambry Thomas, listen. Yeah, he. My, uh, you went to Michigan. I respect you, Ambry. I don't know what you were doing. Yeah, he was er, like they were getting past him, and he was pulling on everybody, mm-hmm. just like breaking coverages, letting guys run wide open. Yeah, yeah. This is another one of those ones. I, I feel like maybe I've gotten a little too excited about it, but I keep thinking. There's got to be a Jamison Williams game in these playoffs. It Listen, just feels like it's coming. Green to Bay that. show they they leave that back end open mm-hmm. if you hit it at the right time. Right. So I don't know. And we just signed Zach Ertz. I think that's a good signing. I I wanted them it was to an sign emergency him. signing. Yeah, but yeah. I wanted them to do it earlier, like when we James both Mitchell thought they would. went down. Yeah. But uh, now they basically had to because they have nobody behind Sam Laporta. But I think if if he can figure out their offense pretty quickly, I think they could use him decently in this game already. I I guarantee on at least one third down, Mm -hmm. Zach Ertz is going to have a big catch. Yeah. I've watched. It may be just like one play. No knock to Brock Wright, but he's way better than Brock Wright. Yes. So, like, what he could do, maybe he's not as good blocking. I know Brock Wright's a really good blocker. Um, But just being able to scheme him up, Zach Ertz. that, that, That play action, like, clear out fake block play that Brock Wright runs. Mm-hmm. Imagine what Zach Ertz can do, right. even at Zach Ertz's age. Right, yeah. Imagine what he could do with the ball in his hands on that type of play. Mm-hmm. Well, the other thing, I, I, I don't remember where I heard it. It might have been on the radio. But they were talking about, like, red zone packages. Like, you could have Dan Skipper come in, be as eligible, and then still have, like, Zach Ertz outside. And, like, you could do some weird things yeah. in the red zone that Ben Johnson might be able to do. I don't think Zach Ertz is going to be like completely involved in the offense, but oh, yeah. I, I think he's going to get a couple plays here and there. So, yeah, it's it's exciting. I don't I don't fully know um, how this is going to play out. I'm, I'm again, I always just hope that it's a good game. I think the way our run defense is played, we should be able to slow McCaffrey a bit. I don't think we're going to stop him. I don't think we're going to be as good against him as we have been. Um, the actually scary part, I think, is his receiving ability out of the backfield. I, I was literally just about to say that's something he that might be the scariest receiver of this game. That's something that we've struggled with a bit, um, pass catching running backs. So that could be a problem. But again, that plays into what the Lions defense wants to do for the most part is they want to play underneath. They don't want any big plays. Um, so that that might be helpful that, you know, maybe they throw it more underneath to McCaffrey and we keep them uh, between the 20s again. But yeah, I don't know. I, I'm I, I said it before the show that I'm most worried about McCaffrey and George Kittle, I think. I don't think I'm worried about Ayuk. I guess if Debo plays, yeah, he'll be probably pretty yeah. scary. Um, because he's more of what we struggle against. But at the same time, I, I started thinking about it that with our safeties playing well, Debo's over the middle a lot. That's where the safeties take up space. So, you know, maybe. Maybe we can corral Debo too. I'm not sure. 
but it's it's crazy. We're 60 minutes from a Super Bowl, and we can do it, potentially. Do you want to make a prediction? My prediction. 28 to 27. Jesus. Lions. Okay. Now, is that going to be the Lions getting like a game-winning field goal or a game-winning touchdown, or is that a 49ers scoring at the end or something? 24-24. 49ers kick a field goal. Well, that would be, be that would be 31-28. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to fix it a little bit. 31-28. Okay. No, 30 31-27, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, 49ers kick a field goal. Lions get it, score a touchdown, and then the 49ers try to drive but can't get there to win. That'd be a heart attack for Lions fans right oh, there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's- Listen, I don't think there's any easy way out of this game. No, I don't either. Yeah, 24-24 in the fourth. 49ers kick a field goal. Mm-hmm. Lions drive down and score. 49ers don't have enough time, or they just can't drive and score. Okay. I'm thinking something like 35-30. I think these defenses are going to be a little bit more pressed. I think they're going to not show up as well. Um, I'm still going to pick the Lions. Um, Unfortunately, I could definitely see them losing this game, but I think everything's going right right now. I think they got the right mindset. I think Dan Campbell has them ready to go. It seems like every game after the game, they're all excited, but they're like, okay, but we're we're still going one more. Like I don't know if you saw uh, Dan Campbell's post game um, in the locker room. He's like, that's two down. We got two more to go. So I think they're going to be ready either way. And if Goff plays like he has been, then I think we could win pretty easily. If he all of a sudden, you know, shows a little bit of signs being on the road that he's, he, you know, messes up or something and throws a, a pick, then we might be a little more, a little bit more nervous. But if he comes out the gate just chucking like he has been, I'll feel really good, and I'll know right away that we have a really good shot at winning the game. Um, I think the other like weird thing that people are going to forget about too, the kicking game could be huge in this game. Yeah, like we said, Michael Badgley he hasn't been great from fifty, but he hit a big one in the Rams game. Jake Moody can hit from sixty, but he's been a little inefficient as well. So like, and this last round, the divisional round, there was a lot of missed kicks, a lot of big missed kicks. Chase McLaughlin missed one for the Bucks. Haven't seen a doink in Ford Field in forever. Usually that goes through. Um, Anders Carlson sucks for a rookie to miss. To, yeah. um, Rough. Kaimi Fairbairn missed one too that was pretty important at, at that point of the game for the Texans. Um, and then there was the big one. And then Tyler the big Bass. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> Tyler Bass. Oh, Poor boy. Bills fans. Um. Okay, we only have a couple minutes. If There's another game. I know. <laughs> There's another game. Well, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. I figured we wouldn't be able to fully break down the other game. But on the other side, we got Patrick Mahomes and Lamar Jackson. Lamar Jackson trying to prove himself to make it to the Super Bowl. Patrick Mahomes trying to ruin everybody's hearts and get Taylor Swift to the Super Bowl again. Well, for the first okay. time. <laughs> get Taylor Swift yeah. there. Get him back again. I'm do going, I, I don't think anybody's beating the Ravens. Yeah. Uh, even with Mahomes' mix of magic and greatness mm-hmm. and luck, like like Brady had, yeah. I I just I think Baltimore is just better mm-hmm. all around. I do too. Yeah, I, I'm I'm obviously a little more biased, but I love what Baltimore is doing. I think Lamar is insane. Um, Isaiah likely has been really good yeah. for that team. Um, and I don't know. Are we really going to see two games in a row where Marquez Valdez Scantling is catching passes? <laughs> like he looked Listen, good last. Almost game. anything is possible with the Chiefs at this point. Yeah, almost anything. But um, that game is before the NFC Championship. If the Ravens win, then I'll be happy. If the Chiefs win, the Lions better make the Super Bowl. <laughs> a rematch with the Chiefs. Yeah. Man, that would Think be about crazy. all the storylines. The Lions kind of becoming America's darling team. Taylor Swift, all the people that don't care about football are going to tune in for her. They're going to hate the Lions. 
a rematch of the beginning of the season is going to end the season, this time with Travis Kelsey, the Lions have a chance, would have a chance to take down Patrick Mahomes, Travis Kelsey, and Taylor Swift. <laughs> Tell me that's not the crazy, it might craziest be the greatest story. Detroit sports weekend in history. It could Man. be. And then Eminem makes a diss track on Taylor Swift. <laughs> That would probably be a little bit, a little too much. <laughs> one time for it would, the one It would time. just be a lion song, just a celebration song. Yeah. It'd be insane. But uh, obviously, we got the 49ers to come first. That game is on Sunday at 630. Again, we have to wait the longest to get our game. And it's on Fox. Who's doing, is that the, what broadcast team is that? CBS is Romo. That's the Chiefs game. Right. Fox, well, Joe Buck has been on ESPN. Him and right. Trey Eggman. They've been doing ESPN. I don't know who does the – is Fox Greg Olson? I can't even remember, to be honest. Is it um, uh, Collinsworth? No, that's NBC. Uh, yeah, that's, that's NBC. Because yeah, the yeah, Lions yeah. have had NBC, NBC games. I can't remember. I think Fox is Greg remember. Olson and uh, – It might be. What's his face? So, hmm. I'm glad we don't have Romo, to be honest. I don't know, Joey. <laughs> I don't know about <laughs> he, that one. He deserves to get Lamar and Patrick Mahomes. He loves his quarterback. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. I'm I'm super excited. 49ers, Lions. Again, we joked about it a couple weeks ago that the Lions had a chance to be, make a Super Bowl. And we joked about it then. Now it's it's like real, real. Yeah. And I if the Lions win this game, I I don't know. What are you gonna do? I, I don't know. If the Lions are in the Super Bowl and you have to wait two weeks for the Super I Bowl. I wish the game was on a Saturday because I want to be in Detroit after they win. But yeah. it's on a Sunday. That'd be crazy. So, yeah. I'll probably take the day off on Monday. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I, I would, like, if the Lions make the Super Bowl, I'll tell Ian and I'll say, uh, the, the, I'm the taking Super Monday Bowl, off. If the Lions won the Super Bowl. Oh, man. Why, taking the week off. Why would anybody in the state of Michigan make people go to work the next day? I don't know. If, if it'd the have Lions to be, won the Super Bowl. It'd have to become a national holiday. Listen, that, that championship parade holiday. will be one of the biggest messes in American <laughs> history. Yeah. A drunken Dan Campbell problem. Drunken Dan Campbell. He's going to have his shirt off just running through the streets. Just like. <laughs> oh, that'd be crazy. <sighs> yeah. Again, we're not trying to get ahead of ourselves, but we're just. It's possible. Theorizing. It's, it's actually. It is. It is. Possible. Yeah. Which is insane within itself. Mm -hmm. I think if the Lions were to beat the Niners, I think I would rather see the Chiefs because they match up better. But either way, if the Lions are able to win. They have a redemption story against the Ravens or the Chiefs. Pretty cool. So, all right. That's about it. Next week, we'll know if the Lions are going to the Super Bowl, if they're going home. Either way, successful season. And I don't know how we're going to top it next year, but we're going to have a good offseason. We're going to have money. We're going to have players that probably want to actually come to Detroit. And I don't know. It's crazy. It's, it's, it's a wild time for the Lions and the Lions fans. But it's been fun. Another big game on Sunday. But uh, this has been Views from the Sidelines, and we will see you guys next time. Taylor Swift is overrated. She always has been.